It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't f*** it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. What is up, my lovely buttercups? Welcome to Main Age Daydream with me, Brian McWilliams, your loving host. You'll notice, by the way, I have decided today to live stream to Rumble. Yes, we are on Rumble. And oddly enough, it does work to live stream to Rumble. We uh, post content on there just as we post to YouTube and other places. Of course, we want you to subscribe to the podcast more than anything, because that's really where we get our ad sales from. So please do subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already on anywhere you plug your ear holes with uh, noises from my mouth. But as pointed out by uh, Libertarian Podcast Review's old own Tyler Yonke, it, it is shocking. If you live stream to Rumble, you get so many more views. So we're doing that today, of course. Also, people in our lines of Liberty Pride will get it. And I'll give you a little sneak preview of the Good Morning Fuckhead rants that I do for our Patreon crew, in addition to the other content we post at the end of the show, talking about, as I put it, the IRS's six degrees to Kevin Bacon, stemming from a unanimous Supreme Court decision, which gives the IRS powers that I don't understand how don't violate the Fourth Amendment. But again, that's at the end of the show. So kick it off today. On this year episode, I got a lot to talk about. Uh, I'm going to have, by the way, Northwestern professor Andy Noppelman on next week's show. We're going to discuss, have a conversation, not a debate, but a conversation about his views that shrinking government would not lead to more freedoms. I, of course, took umbrage with that, and you can hear all of that next week. So subscribe. All right. Today's show. Let's kick it off with some current events news, because there's a lot of it which is why I pushed back this interview for next week. Number one, Elon Musk and Twitter, as I've said before, has become the de facto place for news, for basically news unbiased, or at least unbiased in the way that you can get both sides of the equation if he is to be trusted. And I know there's some debate about that. You're going to believe that you're going to get unfiltered viewpoints on both sides, that they're not censoring one side or the other as we saw during COVID, as we saw under the former leftist regime that was in control of Twitter, as we saw they were kowtowing to the Biden administration, et cetera. So it's interesting to see not only Tucker Carlson leaving Fox News and announcing that he will be bringing his talents to Twitter, LeBron, uh, LeBron James style, but now you have Ron DeSantis, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who was already out campaigning for what looked to be a presidential campaign push. Well, he now has officially announced that he will be coming to Twitter in an exclusive interview slash one-on-one with Elon Musk to announce his candidacy. I can't overstate how much of a shift this is in the media landscape. And, you know, in conjunction with what I think are going to be an additional round of lawsuits against legacy media companies on the left from this nurse who was you know, misportrayed by the media, insultingly so, and I'll talk about that briefly in a second. You're seeing a shift in how media is imbibed by the masses. You're seeing a shift in trust, and you're seeing a shift in how people want to approach getting big news out. I mean, Ron DeSantis could have announced this on Fox. Does this mean he doesn't trust Fox? Does this mean that he knows that Fox has his viewership completely slashed? And that to reach people that are on the right, on the middle, on the left even, that are not these dyed-in-the-wool GOP fanatics, or just to reach the mass population, the place to do that is now Twitter. And he knows that by announcing on Twitter with Elon Musk, Elon Musk's presence is going to, is obviously, <laughs> going to bump up that algorithmically, that this will be the biggest thing trending on Twitter for at least a day or two. And also it gives his communications team a direct con a conduit to interact with people on a real-time basis. If you're announcing in Ron DeSantis, his campaign, people are going to be working full-time and they can now basically see the reactions in real-time as well. I mean, it's a really fascinating exercise in how the media landscape has completely shifted. And as I said earlier, Twitter being the place for news, the place for announcements, the place for live video streams, soon it will be, I guarantee you, the place that people go to watch live concerts, live comedy shows. It is a shift in every possible way. 
It is a shift away from legacy media, which is fantastic. Now, that's one thing, right? The other thing I want to talk about is I talked about the legacy media coming under attack and how you looked at what happened with Nick Sandman and the Coventry Hids, right? Where they were misportrayed by media, intentionally so, because these people had the full video and they intentionally used snippets from these videos to make these white kids from a Catholic school look like they were being disrespectful to a Native American protester who's only there standing up for whatever it might be. The truth of the matter, as we all know, was that the protester was, in fact, more aggressive. He came up to them. He was getting in their faces and being a general asshole. And these kids probably did what you'd want your kid to do. Stand there, be respectful. And people say, well, look at that punchable face. Look at him sneering at him. Well, this guy's being an asshole. The kid's just sitting there holding his ground, not saying anything. Did the right thing. And Sandman got paid quite a bit of money. The kid's never going to have to work again. He's got generational wealth. CNN, NBC, I can't remember the other ones that lost money to this. A lot of them lost their shirts. Now, you look at what's happening now with also, you know, Fox News obviously lost their lawsuit with Dominion, but this latest instance of this nurse who was on video, and I think the video was shared by the black teens that were robbing her of her own bicycle, which she paid for, and which now receipts have come out showing she paid for this bicycle. But this video went viral and was misportrayed by the media as racist white, pregnant white woman right? Goes up. And I did a whole rant about this on Good Morning Fuckhead today, again, behind the paywall. So I'm not going to go too detailed here, but the concept that a pregnant white woman, right? Who is risk adverse, you're protecting the baby in your belly is going up to any teens for any reason to, to steal a bicycle or simply to ask directions is absurd. It's fundamentally absurd. I just spit all over my computer. That's great. It was so absurd, it made my mouth juicy with the absurdity. It was a juicy peach of absurdity. Ridiculous. But the media portrays her as a racist, rushes to judgment, uses these left-wing Twitter accounts, which have you know, edited and misrepresented this clip that was put out there. And to the point where her administration put her on leave from this hospital she worked at because of racism. So she's now gotten a lawyer. She's now going to sue these people. This needs to happen regularly. People need to stand up and say, enough of this misrepresentation, this absolute bias, this attack on the truth that the mainstream legacy media is doing. And it's allowing Twitter to take that place and establish itself in people's minds as where to go to find the truth, or at least the closest representation of truth that exists, because at least it's being filtered through both lenses in real time. So you can find the truth by getting to the middle, right? There's no, I mean, I believe that empirical truth is out there. There's of course one real truth, but because memory is subjective, because people's experiences are subjective, because context is subjective in many cases, the best way to find the truth is by seeing both sides of that equation, which is where our media lets us down, where our government lets us down by obfuscating, by judging, like the BBC is now saying it's got its own misinformation verification system. Why are you the arbiter? A verification on what's real and what's not true when it comes to misinformation. You're as complicit in the lies that took place nonstop over COVID. You are a government-funded entity. The government, the same government in the UK, censored information on social media just like the government in the United States did. So what's misinformation? Because we know that the majority of what was censored, 99% plus of what was censored, was actually shown to be true. Whether it be the labs, whether it be the efficacy of vaccines, whether it be white supremacy in the United States, the government is working in conjunction with media, be it social or legacy, to form and shape the narrative. So, again, Twitter may be our salvation. So let's pivot. We're talking about white supremacy. Let's pivot to the latest white supremacist. Latest white supremacist is a uh, a man by the name of, hold on here. <laughs> of course, now I, I immediately lose the uh, the tweet. Well, anyway, it was a uh, man who seems of he, that he's of Indian descent. And I'll look it up right now because I lost the, uh, the thing I had open. Looks like he's of Indian descent. And he drove a U-Haul into the gates at the White House. Now, this man drove you all into the gates of the White House, supposedly under the banner of white supremacy. Here we go. His name is Sai Vershith Kandula, 19-year-old out of Chesterfield, Missouri, who got a U-Haul, 
drove it into the gates of the White House to, I, I don't know, to, to fly the flag of white supremacy. And he drove this U-Haul. Nothing was in it. No weapons, no explosives, no other people, no furniture. Hadn't decided he just wasn't going to make the move and decided he's going to move into the White House. All that was in there was a Nazi flag and his, you know, it was a wallet. So to fight white supremacy, or I'm sorry, in defense of white supremacy, a non-white man of what apparently is Indian heritage drives a U-Haul into the White House and then conveniently just has a Hitler flag, a Nazi flag, which the police on the scene, by the way, in violation of virtually anything, because you're now moving around evidence, lay the Nazi flag out right in front of this truck that's sitting there, this empty truck driven by this very not white person, laid it out for a perfect foot off. It seems very suspicious. I'll say that. It seems very suspicious, to say the least, in an era where Joe Biden is out there talking about white extremism as the greatest threat to our country. Never mind, it's not in the top 50, as I talked about a couple episodes ago. We've got this kid who, if anything, is mentally ill more than anything to think that, number one, there's any success. I mean, what's the plan? You don't have a gun. You don't have bombs. You don't have anything. You were going to drive a U-Haul into what? The, the window if you got through the gates? And you're supposedly a white supremacist. You're going to go kill the white president of the United States, who, by the way, in his, ha in his past, worked with Strom Thurmond, uh, worked to put a generation of black men in jail in conjunction with Bill Clinton and his whole three strikes initiative, right? It's not like Joe Biden's got a fantastic history here of being a real advocate for the black community. So you're, you're going to go take out this white president who has a history of keeping down minorities and you're going to do it with a Hitler flag and a U-Haul all by yourself. None of this is adding up, everybody. I mean, none of it. This is the most confusing attack. I mean, look, is it... I, I was shitting on the FBI and saying they have to be obliterated from the face of the planet after the Durham report, report came out. Let's take it a step further. Did the FBI help coordinate this? I mean, so often you see these things happen with FBI in conjunction with people are saying the Patriot Front March was just, you know, FBI people that were pretending to be patriots. And honestly, even that's questionable because apparently they pro processed all these people, the ones that were arrested, they processed them and their masks. Didn't take their masks off to take their photos. What? I, I, what? If you're going to process somebody, if you arrest them, the whole point of the mugshot is that you have a facial record. So they don't take the masks off. I mean, the, the, the disbelief that people have to have to buy into these narratives is mind boggling. And they just keep getting more and more bizarre by the day. I mean, the last quote unquote white supremacist that also went out there was not a white person. And look, I'm not saying that it's not possible to be a white supremacist and not be white. It could be something where these people are, again, mentally ill and believe they're white or believe that white people are the salvation. I mean, this would go against every major mainstream media narrative, which tells us that white people are evil and should be condemned and that we're the, the problem here. But... The latest iteration here, if it was an FBI plot, and we find this out later down the road, you know, I got to say that one more reason to disband them because these people are incompetent, even at setting up fake white supremacists to attack the White House. <laughs> I mean, this is what, what fucking brainstorm session where they're sitting around. They're like, all right, guys, got it, all right, we got to think real outside the box here. All right, we got this 19 year old uh, Indian kid. What if we gave him a U-Haul? Bob, you've got a Nazi flag in your garage, right? Can you get the Nazi flag? Can you bring it over? Okay. What? Okay. So here we go. I'll rent the U-Haul. We'll get this kid. We'll take him off his meds or we'll put him on extra meds. One or the other. We'll see, we'll see how it works out in the, in the time. And we'll, uh, we'll give him this car about a block from the white house. We'll just tell him we'll open the gates. Right. And then he just goes in there and kaboom, they find the flag. Bob, you're okay with this giving him your Nazi flag, right? It's not signed or anything. You're, no, you're cool. Give it. Okay, good. Not memorable. Okay, let's go, guys. Like, what the fuck is happening here? And yet, <laughs> this will be used as an example of <laughs> how white supremacy is on the rise in the United States and how it's it's the problem here. It's it defies words. 
another episode or another another uh, topic excuse me and this is gonna, i'm just gonna hop around there's there's so much that happened in the past few days it's, it's hard to put a beat on it and this one honestly just pisses me off i just want to talk about this this hbo max thing that just happened when we're talking about uh things that defy belief the white supremacist brand being turned on its head with all of these non-white uh, white supremacists i just have to get this off my chest because it really pissed me off today hbo max as a service that exists in the streaming world, right? And streaming companies are, are just gone to shit. I was just shaking my head and laughing at the gym yesterday because Marvel has just been taking its lumps for all this woke identity garbage. You know, the MCU, as some people have put it, where they're either changing the race of superheroes, right? They're changing the gender of superheroes, or they're just rolling out all these other, you know, female super identity politics like Miss Marvel is, you know, Ms. Marvel, whatever it is, is this, you know, Indian teenager that nobody likes. It was a show that completely bombed on Disney Plus. Nobody watched it. Yet they shoehorn her into this latest, latest, uh, what is it? Is it Miss Marvel? Captain Marvel movie with that insufferable actress. It's just so annoying. So they shoehorned her in there and everybody's like, who cares? And this movie, this new movie, I think it's called The Marvels, has been delayed like three times or four times because it just seems like another turd nobody wants to see. And this is on the heels of Warner Brothers completely shit canning the, the female Batwoman movie because it was so bad. It tested so terribly, if reports are to be believed, because it was this ultra identity politics woke scolding rather than an interesting film that people actually want to see. So they just killed it. They took like a $20 million bath on it. Rather than, than try to release it, put lipstick on the turd and take a, another bath on marketing and advertising and distribution and everything else. So Disney Plus has been bleeding subscribers. Now, this is partially because people are pissed at Disney because of the stances they take it on gender and trans and everything else. They've Partially, it's because of the content, because the content's been garbage they're rolling out. Then again, people don't want to pay for this woke crap and the old shows only go so far especially if you don't have young kids like i full transparency we pay for disney plus in my house we pay for a lot of the streaming platforms in my house that we probably wouldn't necessarily pay for but i've got a three and a half year old i've got another young child that's eight months you know so we for us it makes sense to have these these streaming platforms because they want to watch you know, whatever, Peppa Pig and Bluey and, you know, we and a lot of time we put on the old Disney stuff that was actually good. We put on like old DuckTales or, or uh, we we're just watching, uh, you know, Chippendales Rescue Rangers and that kind of stuff. But we pay for it. But the thing is, if I didn't have a toddler, I would have canceled Disney Plus a long time ago. The shit that Marvel's putting out isn't worth it to me. The stuff that Disney's putting out isn't worth it to me. They, you know, the animated films that are coming out that are that are these used to be the heartwarming, touching films that were thoughtful. It's just garbage now. So they lost four million subscribers last quarter when they were projecting four million additional subscribers. They were blamed an initial loss of four million on a cricket deal that fell through with India, but none of those people came back if they tried to resolve this. They're actually being sued now by their investors for misrepresenting the future of the company and the profitability of the company. So it's really been fascinating to see Disney go down the shitter. And of course, there's a very public fight they're having with, with Florida and Ron DeSantis. So I was just shaking my head and laughing because after all this, after this pushback where people are saying, we don't want any more identity politics and entertainment. We just want to sit back and be able to watch something and not be lectured and not feel bad and not have to think about this. Well, they just advertise a brand new show that they're rolling out, Disney Plus exclusive, called Chinese Born American. That's the name of the show, Chinese Born American. And it's, a, I don't know, a superhero show. I guess, I don't know, maybe it's tied into Shang-Chi and the Rings of Power. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to find out because I don't care. Who's going to watch this show? I'm guessing Chinese-born Americans? All right, how, what segment of the population are Chinese-born Americans? Outside of that segment of the population, how many people are going to tune into a show called Chinese-born American? Nothing in the title tells you that it's a superhero show that you might like. I wouldn't tune it in either, either way. Again, I'm uh, aggravated with identity politics. Everybody is identifying as, you know, this, that, or the other one because we're told that that's very important. Color of your skin, where you're from, what your race is, what you speak. But the thing is, 
the majority of people now, especially the younger generation coming up, and I know this from a fact, just from knowing a lot of Asian Americans, it's an offensive question. I always thought it was a little bit stupid to be offended by it, right? But it's an offensive question to a lot of Asians. If somebody goes up and says, hey, where are you from? A lot of them will get pissed and say, America, I'm an American. I was born here. Because it's insulting to presume just because of physical appearance that somebody isn't from here and they identify as American. They don't have friends. I'm a Chinese born American. You know, like it's just fucking idiotic. And for Disney, after everything that's happened to roll out a show, did they test it? Did they did they think about what the reactions would be? A show that legitimately is solely focused on identity politics for the title. Now, maybe the show has nothing to do with it, but I got to think it does considering it's called fucking Chinese born American. Is the next show going to be called Nigerian born Canadian? I mean, what the fuck? Stupid. So anyway, streaming industry is taking its lumps. HBO Max has one of the better offerings. Now, technologically shitty had streaming issues that really pissed me off. And actually, we've been watching the original Scooby-Doo's on HBO Max with my daughter, the toddler. So they have HBO, used to be HBO Go. And this is a, a, a perfect example of how you can fuck up your brand. As you know, I am a branding expert. I'm a public relations expert. This is a perfect example of fucking up your brand and turning the hierarchy of branding on its head. Because typically what you want, you want to have a master brand that everybody knows and likes and appreciates, and then you build in under that brand. Not HBO, not Warner Brothers, right? There's Warner Brothers, Discovery. Now it's HBO. And Discovery Plus is another boondoggle, right? They launched Discovery Plus. That thing sucked balls. So now I think they're wrapping it all under what the new streaming service is called, which is Max. But it started as HBO Go. That was an app. You downloaded it. It played HBO. Then they decided it was going to be HBO Max. So that app didn't work anymore, HBO Go. No, couldn't just have the same thing and change the name and change the offer. No, you download another app called HBO Max. HBO Max had HBO content plus some other content plus stuff from Cinemax. Max. Okay, perfectly fine name and title. Technology was still a little shitty. Again, buffering issues. Now they've rolled out a new platform called Max. And this has all the crap from Warner Brothers and HBO and Cinemax and whatever else they, you know, Discovery, whatever else they want to put out. But it's just called Max. And you have to download another app. So, you know, three times you fucking downloaded a new app for this, this same basic content. Now, granted, it's expanded under this new Max content, right? But your brand that everybody knows and loves is HBO. If you're going to rebrand it off of HBO Max, which already encompassed, as I said, everything. It's HBO, which is associated with award-winning content. They had great catchphrase. It's not TV, it's HBO, right? Home box office, people remember it. It's been around forever. It has a legitimacy around it. It has an aura of quality around it. People used to pay. It was the first real pay for program. It still has that aura of like, you're paying for HBO. You've made it, baby. You're getting your money's worth. These fucking idiots. This goes to show you how stupid people in Hollywood are at the studio level, why they make such dog shit content, how stupid people in branding are. Like the, the chick who did Bud Light's campaign that has destroyed that brand must have been freelancing or moonlighting for HBO during this, for Warner Brothers. So instead of keeping the perfectly fine HBO Max brand, they now have rebranded it to Max, new app, which by the way, people can't log into, having pro trouble getting onto it. And then it keeps crashing. Grin, chef's kiss, beautifully done, perfect launch. They now rebrand it to Max. Max has virtually no customer identification. It has no brand to it. It was associated with Cinemax, Cinemax, which is not associated with high level content. And to most of us is associated with late night skin flicks. We called it Skinemax. So third rate porn where you're trying to jerk it, but a candlestick keeps getting in the fucking way of the cunnilingus. That was Cinemax. So they now downgrade to Max, a launch so prolifically fucked up that they had to relaunch Another logo, it just said Max, right? <laughs> and they changed the color from purple to blue on the app. 
It just said Max. Everybody went, what the hell is this stupid shit? And so now to clarify what it is, it says, Max, I'm not making this up. Your home for HBO. <laughs> if you have to tell people, if you rebrand away from a perfectly good HBO Max, it says everything right there to Max and drop the HBO and then have to put in under it the place to watch HBO, you have fucked up your launch so badly that you should be sitting in a forest with one of those little Japanese Harry Carry blades and inserting it into your guts and making a smiley face. You should be fired. All these people should be fired. It's mind-bogglingly perplexing that they went through this exercise. But it goes to show you just how stupid these people are. It's a wow moment. Okay. Next topic. So there's a couple of things. While we're talking about entertainment, I'm going to talk about the trans issue a little bit. Now, again, I have gone on to talk about the trans issue, how under anarchy, I believe that there are benefits for trans people, right? I have nothing against trans people, but I'll tell you what I do have problems with. I do have problems with uh, medicalization and propagandization of young children. In regards to this movement, I have a problem with a medical industrial complex that is solely focused on affirmative care that I think overlooks a lot of mental health issues and jumps the gun. Uh, I have a problem with children that are now coming to regret their decisions, and you're seeing a lot of lawsuits, as I said. And I have a problem with people that are utilizing this not only for profit, but also as a means to get attention. And I mean that from a parental and child standpoint, because trans certainly does seem to be the new goth in that people are identifying it as a way to get a victim status, to get attention for being different and unique, because essentially you identify as trans and now you're a special little flower with special little abilities and nobody can say boo to you and everybody walks around and treats you like you're, you know, you're um, a very special person. So two things. And one of these things speaks to the broader problem with what's going on with the trans movement and why I told people that, and I got an argument about this with uh, talking about trans right activists where I have no problem with the trans movement. I have the problem, I have a huge problem with trans rights activists. And I don't think these things are coinciding in many cases. I think the trans right activists do not speak for the broad majority of trans. I think that their actions, which are many times violent, many times vicious, um, you know, calling people turfs and saying that turfs have to be murdered or be raped or be, you know, all number of things, heinous things. And you see a lot of these actions of protests that are, are pretty evil. Now, I told these people, look, you should denounce the trans, tra the broader trans community should denounce what the trans rad radical activists are doing. And we got this whole back and forth. Oh, you can't demand that they denounce it. And you can't demand that they apologize. I didn't say I demanded they do anything. I'm talking from a communication standpoint, because much like Black Lives Matter, which started with a 90% approval rate and ended with a 30% or less approval rate now because of violent protests, violent, uh, you know, attacks on elderly white people and, and ample videos to show this and, and massive property rights damage and just wanton brutality, violence, you know, just destruction for the sake of destruction. And what did, what did it lead to? The people that ran Black Lives Matter becoming multimillionaires, buying houses in the, the whitest suburbs of Los Angeles, which is hilarious, getting deals with movie studios to make dog shit content nobody watches. Meanwhile, nothing was tangibly improved. Then you could argue that the BLM movement actually hurt the communities it was intended to help because the defund the police movement actually made their neighborhoods less safe and the black population actually as a whole had turned on that, according to the, the most recent polls. So I said, look, you, <laughs> you can't just allow this to happen because it's going to turn people, everyday people against the trans movement. They're doing far more damage than good with these protest videos, with these words, with these, you know, everything they're saying, it's not helping. It's hurting your movement. And of course, well, you can't demand they do that. Okay, fine. Wait and see. Wait and see what happens, dummies. You can tell me that it's not right to make them apologize for these people, but if they don't say anything, it looks like they agree with them. Silence is consent in many ways, right? Or silence is violence if you're on the left. Well, the silence here is enabling violence from these trans radical activists, and that's not going to reflect well on your movement. 
I don't know why this is rocket science to explain to people, but I guess that's why people like me get paid money because the common sense to some people is absolutely missing. So two things we're gonna talk about. Number one is the target issue. Number two is Doctor Who. Actually, I'll swap them. I'll talk about Doctor Who, number one. Tying into the problem with these trans radical activists and the problem with trans ideology being pushed so hard, so fast on people. Doctor Who is under a new showrunner. Actually, I think, it's an old, I think Stephen Moffat might be back. Now, Doctor Who just went through a cycle. If you're not familiar, it's a time-traveling Doctor who basically dies and is recreated in different bodies. It's a convenient way for them to resuscitate the character, to revitalize it, to provide a new face, a new character. You can reinvent it any way you want, really. It's a, it's a part of the character. Doctor Who is always male. In the latest iteration, it was a female Doctor Who. I don't have a problem with this. I didn't really watch it. I watched one episode. I wasn't into it. You know, it, To me, it felt gimmicky. But at the same time, I don't have a fundamental problem with it. Whatever. But I'm a dude. I prefer to watch male characters most of the time. I, that's, I'm a dude. You know, when, you, when you're talking about entertainment, oftentimes, just like reading a book, you like to put yourself in the shoes of the character. And if, it obviously helps if that character is of your same gender. So I didn't really get into it. Now they're rebooting it. And, and by the way, the ratings did go down quite a bit when the female doctor took over for whatever reason. It kind of goes to like Bill Burr's argument about the WNBA when like people go, well, the ratings went down. These beasts, men are sexist. Well, why didn't women watch it? If, isn't that the point, right? You put a woman in there. Shouldn't women want to watch this show? Wasn't that the whole point? Is, it, is the whole point to shame men <laughs> or is it to get females to watch the show as well? If they didn't, it seems like it's on them. It was again, the Bill Burr joke, you know, you're telling us men to watch it. Look, we got men's sports to watch. You, if no one's going to see the WNBA, then shut the fuck up. That means women didn't go. Sorry, you know, that, that's the market. So the Doctor Who has said that the latest season that's uh, due to come out, I think in a few months, will feature a transgender character in the name of Rose. Now, Rose was and is the Doctor's primary, or many episodes or many seasons, a primary sidekick to Doctor Who. I'm not sure, I didn't think Rose was a Time Lord and capable of, I don't know, re resuscitating herself, but I don't know. Somehow they're introducing this character as Rose. It's a transgender male as who, I don't know, identifies as a female. I don't really care about the name, irrelevant, but you know, also black, if that helps. Now, I will tell you, frankly, if this had happened in any season in the past, other than probably the last one, because again, I, I identified that with woke culture anyway. If that had happened any time in the past, I probably wouldn't have even like blunk an eye. I wouldn't have thought about it. It wouldn't have mattered to me, to be honest. It would have kind of gone along with, okay, it's a sci-fi show and it's kind of interesting. You know, there's all these wacky characters in here. Okay, so this character's trans. I wouldn't give it a shit. I probably still would have watched it. I wouldn't have thought of it. I've watched a lot of other shows that had trans characters in them. Bob's Burgers has a trans character. I didn't, wouldn't bother me. It still, still probably won't bother me, except that it's the timing of these things. And that's what these people don't quite grasp, or they, or they grasp it, they don't grasp the negative connotations of it, how this is going to play out. Because in the past, you could have done it. And this is my issue with how fast they're pushing this thing, because you're going to get a rebound effect naturally when you try to push an ideology so hard, so fast, and so much in people's faces. If they had done it in a previous season, like I said, I would have watched it. I wouldn't have thought of it like, oh, that's interesting. Let's see if it's any good. Let's see if this character's any good. Let's see if this character's interesting. It would have provided an opportunity to showcase what the character can bring to the table. And maybe it would have won some people over to people being trans and be like, oh, okay, it's not a big deal. It's a man, it's a woman, it seems to be fine to me. I don't really give a shit. But the problem is now because of this cultural warfare, when you shove a character into the show at this time in a prominent show and then make a fucking huge deal about it as they're doing, you're going to piss people off. Because now it's not just a character in a show. Now it is a political and cultural statement of ideology masquerading as a character in the show. That's what it's going to boil down to. Whether or not that's going to be the character as written, I don't know. But I'll tell you the perception, and that's the perception. Okay, let's talk about the target trans issue now. Now... There is a company that is, oh, Yasmin Finney. Sorry, that's the trans person in the new Doctor Who, Yasmin Finney. Okay, so Target, there's a Target story. T 
Target's taken some heat because, number one, Target's been a long time, just like D. Snyder, right? a long time advocate, ally, if you want to call it, for LGBTQIT, uh, XYZ, third nation, whatever the fuck, spirit animals. And they've had clothing that would represent that, okay? I don't have a problem with that in any way. Now, what I do have an issue with, and I've said this before, is when Target starts to cater to a minuscule section of the population by changing around what's in different sections of their store and putting girls' places and boys' places and mashing them all into one, mainly because as a consumer, it's unnecessary and it's stupid and confusing for me to go into a store where I'm trying to find shit for my daughter and having to say, okay, well now all this is crap is mushed together. I'm trying to find one certain thing. It's like, if I go into a grocery store, I don't want to have the sausages next to the canned peas next to the milk. I want the shit in the section so I can find the shit that I need to get to quickly get in, get out and go on with my fucking life. Okay. So target though, has come under fire, not only for that aspect, but for the broader aspect now of offering in the children's section, swimming suits that have extra room for dicks and chest binders for little girls. These things I can understand people getting upset about because it goes along with the entire issue we're having here, which is the normalization of transgenderism to children that are arguably way too young to understand it. If you want to have a chest binder in the teenage girl section, even that, I would say, if you want to find a chest binder, I prefer it be in a specialty place. I prefer you have to seek that out. But I understand it, right? I'm not going to boycott Target over it. Same thing with the swimsuits that have extra dick room. I'm not happy Target is stocking it. If they want to do it, that's their prerogative. I'd prefer that be in a specialty location where people can find that if they need that extra room. But still, it's not hateful to have it. I don't think it's pushing anything beyond the boundary. I think probably it's more confusing than anything when people go and buy a swimsuit they like, and then they get home and their daughter goes, hey, why does this swimsuit have a dick pouch? Because it's clearly a girl's swimsuit. Confusing again. So this latest thing has come to the forefront though is people are saying that Target is working with, and this is factually accurate, working with a designer who has a, as its forefront uh, for the design brand, a gay, well, actually I should say, a, a woman who has had the surgery to chop off her breasts and now identifies as a man. This is uh, Ab, Ab Prelinuk. I'm not, I'm not great with these names. Ab Prelin. Yeah, Ab Prelin is the brand Abprolin UK. And this brand, even though the designs in Target are very focused on LGBTQI trans, right? The brand has Satanist imagery and the owner of the brand basically says, you know, on record many times, I'm a big fan of Satanism. It's great, fantastic. Everybody should be a Satanist, right? Okay, so you can understand people on the right or, or religious people would get offended by this. Those brands aren't in Target though. And I do not have a favorable opinion of people going after people's uh, opinions on products that aren't in the store, boycotting a store because they're doing, you know, work with this brand that does something else somewhere else. I think that's a little bit stupid. I can get it on a level of, okay, they should vet the people a little bit more. But to me, it feels a little bit too cancel culturally. If they have multiple lines there's a lot of places that have multiple lines that are catering to specific portions of the population. And if anything, I should say that's the way it should be. As I said, seek it out. If you need a bathing suit, a girl's bathing suit that's got room for a dick, well, seek it out. People are not being provided Satanist gear at Target. They have to seek that out somewhere else, okay? What I do have an issue with, though, is Target's having children's clothing right? That is like for toddlers, for babies, for kids that are very adolescent, that is leaning into this gender slash culture, identity, bullshit war that's going on right now, right? For example, there were shirts, like baby shirts or toddler shirts that say queer, queer, queer on it, right? Or I, L, LGBTQ, I'm a gay. You know, this, these are legitimately the shirts that are in there. There's no way in hell a three-year-old 
is going to go to Target. Number one, three-year-olds can't read. Is going to go to Target and go, I want the shirt that says queer, queer, queer on it. That's not a thing. That's not a thing that ever is happening ever in the history of the world unless there is a parent pushing that ideology on them that's telling their kids or, or a teacher or I don't know what else. Telling their kids, we got to go and say, you're queer, you identify as this, I does that. Even if a kid says, I feel like a girl. You're not going to go out and buy a shirt. No kid's going to say, I want a shirt that says I'm a girl in big rainbow lettering and you go to fucking Target and you buy it. That's not it. These products are not marketed for children to wear them as children. These products are marketed at adults, at parents who want attention or at children who want attention. I have a very hard time believing that anybody who legitimately identifies as trans, who's going through gender dysmorphia, who believes they are a boy in a girl's body or vice versa, is going to go out and buy a shirt that says, hey, I'm a trans. What mostly people want as a whole, and I believe this of the trans population as well, and trans people that are watching this, please let me know if I'm wrong here. Not trans activists, mind you, real trans people. Tell me if I'm wrong here, but don't you just want to live your lives in peace? Don't you want to be left the fuck alone as we all do? I'm a libertarian for a very good reason. I want to be left the fuck alone. I want you to be left the fuck alone. Don't you want to live your life in peace? Don't you want to live your life as normally as you possibly can? If you don't, if you're, I mean, and that basically entails, you know, if you identify as a woman, fine, but you're, you're going to wear normal women's clothing, right? You're not going to go out with a giant sign that says, I got a dick, but also titties. It's, you know, that's not going to be a thing that you do if you want to live a normal life and be left alone. And I know people will say, well, living trans isn't normal. No, it's not a normal life. And we need to acknowledge that as well. It's not normal. It is not normal. Nor do I think should it be viewed as normal. But respectfully, we can say, okay, we identified this thing. It exists. We're going to treat these people with respect. Fine. But those people aren't going to go out there and buy a shirt that says queer, 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 trans, 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 and wear it around and try to attract attention. Otherwise, that's not somebody trying to live a normal life. That's not trying, trying to live a happy life. That's trying to antagonize. That's trying to get attention. And it's, that's a very different issue than identifying as a different gender and authentically trying to live your life in the most happy sense. That is trying to push a cause, trying to get attention, trying to essentially wave a flag in the air that says, everybody come here and look at me. And that's what most of this, I think, is about. Like I said, this is the new goth. This is the new way to get attention, to get special privileges for parents and for children. And the people that Target's marketing this shit to are those parents like Charlie's fucking Theron who really want to get attention for the fact that they have a trans kid. They're the ones buying the shirts that say queer, queer, queer and putting it on a two-year-old. The two-year-olds that, that, well, two-year-olds don't know what the fuck they want to wear other than a pattern or a design. They don't know what it says on them. Let's say an uh, elementary school kid wears a shirt that says queer, queer, queer on it, old enough to read. That kid also wants attention more than they want anything else. And that's marketed towards generating attention. That's what I have an issue with. Now, I don't think a lot of the people boycotting Target have that same issue. They're probably coming at it from a little bit more of a fundamental issue again with religion, with the propagandization of children uh, and worries about where that leads. But my argument, I think, also holds merit in that it cuts to a core of this issue, which is attention-seeking. All right, there you go. Let's talk about a couple more things real quick, and then we'll wrap it up. A little longer episode, but I'm feeling good today. I'm feeling fine. I'm doing this episode a little earlier. Get me some nice lunch after. Okay, um, real quick, I just want to talk about this horse shit with Zelensky going around. You know, the the Pentagon magically found $3 billion more that benefits Ukraine. Oh, wow, <laughs> isn't that incredible? Biden just said there's another $357 million we're going to give to them, right? Money laundering 101. The UK, Zelensky just did a whole big trek around the UK, hugging people and 
yeah, like what a great guy. And in Canada, oh, the Canadians, they love to. It's really fascinating. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has talked about this, but it's something that's fairly common knowledge now because it's come out. It's, it came out in the Ukrainian documents and, and people have said this on the United States side, the military uh, generals. Well, that Ukraine is basically just an Afghanistan for the Soviet Union, once again, because the Soviet Union got its ass kicked in Afghanistan. It was argument that they want us to get sucked into Afghanistan, which worked for 20 years, right? Complete waste of time, money, uh, thousands of people murdered and displaced for no good reason. And now generals, U.S. generals are on record saying, well, we wanted to make sure that this is a, uh, a process that really depletes the Russian military, making them incapable of functioning anywhere else in the world because they're now in this boondoggle, uh, this swamp, or this trap in Ukraine. And they're more than happy to keep that trap going, to keep it as ongoing, as cumbersome, as injurious as possible, not only to Russia, but because fuck Ukraine. And I've been arguing this from the get-go, that from a humanitarian perspective, you want this war to end. Ukraine is destroyed, absolutely ravaged. They're getting their asses kicked. We know that, again, from these leaked documents from Discord. As It was always apparent to anybody really paying attention that Russia was winning this war. There's no possible way Ukraine is beating them, as the mainstream media was telling us. We know that's fundamentally a lie in every way. Despite all the money, despite all the weapons, despite all the tactical uh, support that we're giving them, Russia had more troops, was better armed going in, and Ukraine had to play catch up the whole time. And at this point, the country has been decimated. They just recently gave up, was it uh, Bak, uh, blanking on the name of the city, but the stronghold they said would never fall. Of course, it, it fell. Russia's taken it. But the United States is more than happy to continue to pour money and weapons and time and troops and everything else into Ukraine, as is the rest of NATO, to keep Russia embroiled in this conflict. And they could give zero shits about the number of Ukraine lives lost, which are at least three to one what Russia is losing in a country that, I mean, at this point has made it illegal to escape. Right. That's factually I talked about this many months ago. They made it illegal to escape. You're not allowed to get a passport to leave. You're essentially the drafts there. Even if you wanted to, if you don't believe in this fight, you believe that we're being taken advantage of as Ukrainians, you can't leave the country. Zelensky's outlawed their major religion. It's just depressing to think about that at the end of the day, this really looks like more and more that it is a trap that's set for Russia because they knew Russia wanted these regions. They wanted, you know, they need to protect Crimea as a warm naval base. They set this trap, and now the Ukrainians are just stuck in it for God knows how long. And as I've said as well, the people that are going to be paying for the reconstruction of this when it's all over, should Russia not take over the whole nation, which I don't even think they want, what's going to end up happening is they're going to call a ceasefire. It's going to get negotiated where the Donbass region uh, goes to Russia, where Crimea is, of course, still with Russia, and the rest of Ukraine goes back to being Ukraine, and American taxpayers, and to a very small extent, NATO, will pay for the reconstruction. That's what's going to happen. But it's just unbelievable, and it just keeps on going. Okay, last two things. I've got to play you this video of a psychopath. So this is at Hunter College in New York City, showcasing the people that are entrusted to teach your children, to be safely around your children, and also to mold the future are psychopaths. This is Hunter College is a notable, very left, extreme left uh, college in New York State. And this video just came out to yesterday from the New York Post, two New York Post studies here. I'll play you this initial video of a adjunct professor named uh, Shellen Rodriguez, who went off on these pro-life students. And now, if you're just listening, I'll describe the scene to you. They are at a table. They're minding their own business. They have a table in, I don't know, a hallway or a quad that has anti-abortion materials, pamphlets on the table, right? And now I'll play this video and we can take it from there. I'll let it speak for itself and then we'll come back and I'll tell you another little fun tidbit which came out right afterwards. 
Oh, I hate it when it doesn't play the sound. Hold on, there we go. You're not educating shit. This is propaganda. What are you going to do, like anti-trans next? Is that what you're going to do next? I mean, no, we're, we're talking about abortion. This is shit. This is violent. You're triggering my students. Oh, I'm sorry about that. You're, no, you're not. Because you I'm can't sorry. even have a baby. That's so you don't even know what that is. That's you don't that's even that's know that's what this is. Get this shit out of here, man. Fuck this shit. Okay, so that is a professor at a college going up to students who are peacefully handing out materials at a table. They're not ranting and raving. They're not yelling at people. They're not intimidation. She tells them that it's violent to share a contrary opinion. That, that opinion that abortion isn't the greatest thing ever, that we shouldn't celebrate the murder of unborn children, right? So you've got this fucking piece of shit woman going up, yelling at these kids, cursing them out, telling them that they're not educating shit, essentially, you know, again, trying to censor them, trying to inhibit their, their free speech. Not only that, but then she gets violent. She tells them, she tells them it's violent for them to stand there handing a pamphlet out quietly and peacefully and yet gets violent. And it, tell me this isn't a recurring theme, gets violent with them by smashing their pamphlets off, she throws like it looks like a little briefcase that must have had something on it, like a display in it. She smacks that into a person, shoves all their shit on the floor, and then marches off. This is a professor acting like a child. I mean, this is a temper tantrum from somebody that's entrusted to teach young people acting like a fucking baby. Now, it gets even better, though, because after that, number one, the union that represents the uh, CUNY grad students and professors, they put out a statement saying that she was justified because she was standing up to far-right extremism. Because clearly, having an anti-pro-abortion stance, arguing, again, as I said, that maybe we should have a discussion about what abortion actually boils down to is far-right extremism in these people's minds. And to this entire academic curriculum uh, or academic uh, staff, because their union has said this. I mean, that's just unacceptable. Not only that, but they're clearly in favor of her inhibiting the free speech of these students on campus and violently attacking them. But it gets better. You want to see just how crazy this person is? Okay, well, let's go to this another story. Let me share my screen so you see the pictures here of this psychopath. Who, who should have been fired, she should have been fired or at least suspended while they investigate this issue by the school, by Hunter College in New York City. But here we go. A New York Post reporter went to her apartment, which, you you know, he went in the apartment. He didn't go, he didn't, I'm sorry, went into her apartment complex. He's in the hallway. He knocks on her door. This crazy ass motherfucker comes to the door with a machete and screams at him to get the fuck out of here. Now, I'm looking at the pictures because they had a photographer there with the reporter. You can see the picture of her holding a machete to his neck. She came out of her apartment. She didn't even have to open the door. She didn't have to come out of the apartment. She didn't have to talk to him. She could have simply say, I'm not talking to you. The guy knocked on her door. She chose to come out wielding a knife, put the knife to his throat in a threatening manner, and then threaten him yelling, get the fuck away from my door or I'm going to chop you up with this machete. Again, this is a woman trusted to teach children. Now, not only did she threaten them in the hallway, but they left, right? They left. The reporter and his photographer left. She then chases them down as they're on the street, she, it wasn't enough for her to hold a machete to this guy's throat. She puts a hoodie on because it's cold outside, puts a hoodie on, comes outside still with the machete, chases them down the street, screaming, get the fuck off my block, and then assaults the photographer by kicking him in the shins. This person is a teacher. This person should be fired. She should be barred from being in any student, anywhere around students. I mean, I'm talking restraining order 
from being around students. She should be shamed. She should be canceled, rightly so, for being this depraved. But this goes to show you the people that are welcomed, that are normal in these academic circles are this deranged, that this is acceptable behavior to the point where her fucking union put out a statement supporting her. wonder if they're going to retract that. All right. And last thing, guys, I'm going to allow this to speak for itself for the most part. I'll play it. I may weigh in, but this is a sample. So I said he talked about this IRS, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon IRS bullshit is astounding. I'm going to play a good morning fuckhead rant. These are just audio only. It's five minutes long. I might pause it to add a little something at the end, but let me go ahead and play this for you. You get a taste of our bonus content. Again, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty or lionsofliberty.locals.com. And uh, you won't believe that the Supreme Court in unison said that this was okay. Good morning, fuckhead. Who's the fuckhead? Is it me or is it you? I don't know. Let's talk about crap. Good morning, fuckhead. Good morning, fuckheads. Incredible story here in that the Supreme Court unanimously has ruled in a delinquent taxpayer case that the IRS can secretly obtain bank records of third parties when collecting on taxes owed. I don't in my fucking brain understand how this doesn't violate uh, the Fourth Amendment, frankly, because basically what happens here is that the IRS wants to investigate people for tax evasion, tax fraud, whatever else. So they go and they seize their bank records, right? They do the investigation. This ruling has now essentially permitted the FBI, or I'm sorry, the FBI, the IRS to not only do that, but also to obtain bank records for people associated with the person they are investigating. Now, conceptually, I can say, okay, I get this because you're investigating this person. You're trying to find out how these other bank records impacted their illegal use or legal use of funds. However, on a basic constitutional slash privacy basis, there should be a notification to that person. There should be a warrant that has to be given. And if I'm that, if I'm just basically looking at this on a thousand foot view, you now have an IRS, which is basically going to have access and will abuse this fucking privilege, by the way, 100%, to investigate people beyond who they're already investigating, right? Clearly, if they're saying you can access third-party bank records while well, during investigation, and then guess what's going to happen? Well, probably now that's going to spawn yet another investigation because now you have access to their bank records. Well, you know, we have this questionable uh, interaction between these two parties, one of which is being investigated. Well, I guess we should audit and investigate this other third party. And then what's going to happen? Oh, that's right. They're going to go into their bank records. And now they have access to somebody else's bank records and all their third party contacts. This is the fucking Kevin Bacon of investigations into your private banking records. This is unbelievable fucking bullshit. And yet, justices, including Gorsuch, had said that they are totally fine with this. Totally fucking fine with this. Now, I don't know at this point what you can really do, right? I mean, now it's codified. Now there's precedent set for it. It's a unanimous ruling. So unless we somehow completely abolish the IRS, which, of course, I'm 100% for, I don't know how you even push back on this. I I legitimately don't even fucking understand how you can push back on this. Justice Roberts wrote, Congress has given the IRS considerable power to go after unpaid taxes. One tool at the service's disposal is the authority to summon people with information concerning a delinquent taxpayer. Generally, the IRS is required to provide notice to anybody named in a summons who can sue to quash it. However, this is an exception to that general rule. They're allowed to request the production of books, papers, records, and other data from any person who possesses information concerning a delinquent taxpayer. Any person who possesses possesses information concerning a delinquent taxpayer. That is unbelievably broad. Unfucking believably broad. 
I mean, I just, I just can not believe it. And now, you know, Gorsuch again, back this up. I, I just, I, I just can't believe it. And the, uh, the lawyer, or sorry, Paul Sherman, counsel for Institute of Justice, a nonprofit public interest law firm, uh, expressed the same alarm I did. This is from an Epoch Times article. The ruling raises serious Fourth Amendment concerns. Thankfully, the court stressed that its ruling was narrowly focused on the question before it. In a future case, the court should address the constitutional limits of the government's power to demand access to people's most sensitive financial information. Yeah, yeah, they should. But as I said, now there's fucking precedent. Now there's broad-based precedent. And the IRS is going to use this as a green light to go ahead and, as I said, Kevin Bacon the fuck out of this motherfucker. I just... I am just at a loss for words. All right. Well, sorry to bring you down on a Monday. Good morning, fuckheads. There you go. So there's a little taste of good morning, fuckhead, that rant. And I think I, I pretty much said it all. I don't really have much to add to it. I think I got it all there. It, it is It is unbelievable. It's just the same thing as the FBI hop system. Uh, actually, this is what, yeah, it's the, it's the same thing as the FBI hop system, which I, they had actually reined in because under the Patriot Act, the FBI had six hops from an initial source that they were allowed to wiretap, right, and get the phone records for. That, of course, encompasses everybody in the United States, nay, the world, right? If you have six people, the, connect, the connectivity between one person, then you could go, okay, you get anybody within his his sphere, that's one. Then anybody in their sphere, that's two. Anybody in their sphere, that's three. I mean, the exponential reach of this, and the IRS is basically done the exact same fucking thing here. And the Supreme Court says, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. They don't have to let you know. It's absurd. It's fucking absurd. So there you go, guys. All right, hope you enjoyed today's, yeah, bleh, bleh, today's show. Um, a little longer today, you lucky ducks. So as a thank you for this extra long episode of Excellence, you can subscribe to the podcast. Please do not only to mine, they have the solo feeds for me and age daydream and for finding freedom. Of course, our Monday show with John Odermatt. I'm going to have, I said, uh, uh, Andrew Noppelman on from Northwestern university for next week. I'm also going to have Brett Smith on, uh, the following week. And, you know, we'll, uh, we'll play it by ear as far as what Brett and I talk about. He's a funny guy and has a lot of experience in the comics industry. So it'll be uh, fascinating to talk to him about the backlash he's gotten for his beliefs, his work on uh, on some of the Clinton Cash uh, comic books, etc. That'll be a fun conversation. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of it to the Lions of Liberty Network and the solo feeds. And again, if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, please hit the notification button And in addition to subscribing because we do get shadow banned. We're shadow banned forever. So even though we've got, you know, on YouTube, like 7,000 of you subscribed, we don't really get that many uh, views because they don't show you that we have our content up. So hit the notification button. All right, that's it. Thank you from me, Brian McWilliams from the Lions of Liberty. Oh yeah, give us five-star reviews on, on iTunes and all that shit. From the Lions of Liberty Network, from Mean Age Daydream. Keep those electric eyes on me, babe. And keep that ray gun to my head.